Thank you very much, uh, Francois. It's uh, thanks for, for lining up such a wonderful uh, group of speakers. Um, and, and indeed, um, the way that, that you summarized um, uh, the evolution of thinking um, in, in development, development policy, along with the recent experience on growth is, is uh, I think, very much sets the background against which um, we, have to be, uh, we have to be doing our thinking and developing our new frameworks. Um, I'm actually a, a relatively um, optimistic about what has happened in development economics. Uh, if you look at it from one perspective, it looks like it's more divided and split and, and, uh, and disputatious than, than ever with the you know, people at the micro, micro end uh, doing things that the macro and growth people uh, saying that, you know, this won't ever amount to anything uh, broadly and, and, and uh, useful in a macro sense, and the macro, micro people saying, uh, you know, all the thing that the macro and the institutions people do is, is you know, is, is, you know, is just pure speculation because you can never really uh, identify causal effects without uh, um, sort of experimental evidence or at least very, uh, um, very strong uh, econometric identification, which typically doesn't exist in the macro literature. I actually think that that there has been um, a, 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 an amazing uh, amount of convergence um, once you go beyond the question of what are the uh, tools that we use um, and once you sort of are willing to push yourself from the thought that there is just one tool uh, that everybody ought to use, uh, once you understand that different questions uh, necessarily require um, different kinds of tools, uh, there has been an, a, a, a striking convergence um, in the way that, that we've begun to think about development and development economics. And, uh, uh, and interestingly, this is a convergence about the way to think about development. It's not a convergence about development policy. Uh, because two of, the two, two of the three periods that Francois showed you were in fact periods where there was convergence both in theory and about what development policy ought to consist of. You know, the, the planning and poor substitution kind of policies and then the structural adjustment kind of policies. Uh, those were all convergences about what governments ought to do. And I think what has happened more recently um, uh, is that in fact we have a perspective on growth that says, well, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, different strokes for different folks uh, in a way that's actually much more uh, theoretically driven. Uh, and that's sort of both from the macro end, where with people with a focus on macro and institutions basically saying, well, there are these broad patterns, these are broad causal mechanisms, uh, but that the way that you would actually implement this is highly country specific. So therefore, the operational policy implications of this really depend a lot from context to context. And of course, with the micro people basically saying, it all depends. Uh, it depends on the very specific context and intervention that's sort of here isn't going to work there. And there's a certain amount of sort of broadly experimental, what I would call experimental mindset in, in policy application and policy design that focuses much more on sort of identifying which particular model fits best, uh, identifying which therefore intervention is going to uh, uh, have the biggest impact uh, in a particular context. Um, and as much as sort of the micro people want to keep themselves apart from the macro people and vice versa, uh, I think that sort of that uh, is, is, is at some meta level, I think, has been a convergence uh, there about uh, how to think uh, about the heterogeneity of the experience. I might say a little bit more about that in, in the panel. What I want to focus on uh, during my, my comments um, now is really a, 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 a sort of a con convergence uh, if you will, within sort of broad models of macro. And here I want to talk about a convergence between the old traditional um, dual economy type models, uh, which emphasize structural heterogeneity, in particular the distinction between a traditional side, the, the traditional part of the economy and the modern part of the economy, um, uh, uh, and, and how those are have now actually come back and in some sense have converged with the uh, so with, the, with modern growth theory, uh, which traditionally was a sort of a, a, in terms of you know a single sector aggregate uh, models of growth, and it turns out that you can sort of uh, the the the, um, the the new models of the, the you know sort of um, you know post solo kinds of models of growth have uh, uh, have a lot to uh, 
teach um, those of us who work in the, in the dual economy tradition and vice versa. And some of the best work that's going on actually is integrating insights uh, from, from the two. And, and that's, that's the line that I want to push and see, in fact, how that takes us farther in, uh, in terms of understanding uh, the evolu uh, evolution of growth. This is a, another way of, of looking at um, the picture that um, uh, Francois showed you. Uh, what's on the uh, vertical axis now is, is not actually per capita GDP, but it's actually growth rates. But because growth rates tend to fluctuate a lot, I've just smoothed those trends out. And smoothing uh, these trends and looking at, at developing versus developed, uh, what you see is this very striking uh, gap that's opened up in favor of developing countries in the last two decades. Um, it's a very large, it's sort of a growth rate differential of the order of 4%, 4 to 5 uh, percentage uh, uh, points, which uh, means effectively very rapid convergence. Now, some of this is because the developing, the advanced countries are growing less rapidly, uh, but much of it is because the developing countries have picked up. It's a bit of a statistical illusion because it's not that the growth rate in the developing countries keeps on increasing, it's just that China, which is such a large, it be becomes bigger and bigger part of the aggregate, and it's so much uh, more rapidly growing than the rest that the average growth rate when you do it on a GDP-weighted basis, um, uh, in, in increases. So, uh, you know, so th this is the good news. It seems what's really happening recently, um, and and uh, this is you know sort of looking, you know, uh, distinguishing among different um, uh, groups of countries. Again, obviously, East Asia has done best, but what you can see is that even Latin America and Africa are back to the kind of growth rates that they had in the 50s and 60s. So even they are growing as rapidly, if not more so, uh, than they, they, they ever did. Now, um, so the question is, is you, know, you can say this is wonderful, we're now in a new era of growth, but you can also say this is all very transitory, that we've had basically a, two, a decade or two of very good uh, um, uh, uh, news. Um, and that this is unlikely to continue. So I'm going to end up more or less uh, uh, on, on this side of the argument, but before I do that, so let me, let me, let me develop the, the, the conceptual framework um, a, a little bit more. First, I mean, we re know that the kind of convergence that we've experienced uh, in, in, re in the recent uh, period is very much the exception. That is, if you look at um, sort of ever since the the first divergence occurred after the Industrial Revolution where the, when the world got first divided between a you know, growing and, and a richer uh, part and a, and a developing part on the basis of, of that sort of initial um, uh, division of labor uh, globally, that convergence uh, in the sense of countries that are poor growing more rapidly than countries that are rich has been very much the exception. Two different ways of looking at it. Uh, one sort of in a very long-term perspective uh, between 1870 uh, till 2008. Uh, there's absolutely no relationship uh, between countries that are, you know, sort of countries' initial level of income and how rapidly they've subsequently grown. You can also look at it on a decade by decade basis, which is the second panel. So the, in that panel, every country uh, enters once for every decade between 65 and 2005. Again, on a decade to decade basis, there is no evidence that uh, of, 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 condition, of unconditioned, unconditional convergence. So, um, so the standard growth theory um, basically has um, incorporated this empirical finding by distinguishing between conditional and unconditional convergence. Uh, so these pictures um, clearly show that there is no unconditional convergence uh, in the data. The kind of experience we've had in the last decade is very much uh, the exception. Um, and so this, the standard theory basically says that even though you know, at some you know, uh, basic level of theory, you might expect that latecomers should develop more rapidly because they have access to technology that's already been developed. They have access to capital and savings from the advanced countries. They have access to global markets. All of those would tend to facilitate rapid growth on the part of latecomers. Uh, but they, in fact, face all kinds of other headwinds uh, having to do with bad policies, weak institutions, poverty traps, geographical disadvantages, all kinds of things um, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm basically going to shorten, uh, use the term fundamentals uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a shorthand uh, for all of those conditioning variables. 
So the conventional theory in, in, in growth is that basically convergence is conditional, and, and, and the way that we write it is um, interesting arrows. Um, so something has happened. So think of, so it's not even regular. So one is up, one is down. So this is interesting. Yeah, so the arrows, whether they're going up, no. Oh, I see, so, that's right. But no, the initial, so this is, this is a hat. This is a, a superscript. Uh, this is a subscript, and this is a subscript. <laughs> yeah, so the rate of, so J is a country. Um, uh, so Y hat J is the growth rate of country J. Um, is a function of the rate of convergence with the speed of convergence given by the coefficient gamma. Um, and growth rate is going to be a function of how large the difference is between that country's present level of income and its long run level of income. So where star is this long run level of income and the long run country's long run level of income is determined by that country's fundamentals. So this is where the conditional convergence comes in. So this theta j, think of them as a, as a whole vector of fundamentals that determines that country's long run uh, level of income. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to shorten this as fundamentals. Think of them as a mix of human capital and institutional uh, 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 arrangements. Um, perhaps other things too, like geography, okay? But this is conditional because you have, the, you have long run levels of income being determined by a country's fundamentals. Growth rate are obviously going to be a function of those fundamentals. And only to the extent that your fundamentals converge with the fundamentals of the uh, rich countries would you actually converge to there. So this is a standard representation that basically takes into account sort of you know, how you know, sort of modern growth theory has incorporated uh, sort of the empirical evidence and then the whole, you know, for two decades we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what enters here. Um, and I would say not necessarily with a whole lot of, of, of progress. I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, um, now what did, however, um, okay. Now let's bring, let's bring the uh, dual economy framework here. What was the main contribution of the dual economy framework from um, Arthur Lewis and, and on? Uh, the main contribution was to say, look, developing countries aren't simply like advanced countries, but sort of having radially shrunk in all dimensions. That there's a huge difference between the modern parts of the economy and the traditional parts. And the main difference is that the modern sector has all kinds of advantages, is on a different, you know, uh, um, it is, is, uh, is a sector um, that has a different technological uh, uh, trajectory, um, operates on, on, on very different um, kinds of, 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 of basis than the traditional one. Um, and the process of economic development is one whereby more of the traditional sector, you have resources flow from the traditional to the modern sector. Now, in that old tradition, sort of typically when we thought about the, um, about the modern part of the economy, we, we thought about industry, modern industry. So that was to be, supposed to be the archetypal uh, uh, process, or, uh, archetypal um, uh, example of a modern sector. Now, uh, we know that for uh, the economy as a whole, there is no convergence. It turns out, however, that for, if you look at these modern industries, you recover convergence, and you recover it uh, in a, um, in, a um, uh, uh, in, in, in quite a striking way. Um, so let me explain to you uh, what this is. This is just four industries. This is data from UNIDO. Uh, so think about these as, as, as each one of them as a two-digit formal organized manufacturing industry. Um, and this is sort of uh, for all countries for which these data exist. Now it turns out that if you draw those um, convergence charts um, uh, for each one of these individual industries across countries, you find that in fact labor productivity in these industries, the analog of GDP per worker, uh, labor productivity in these industries is indeed subject uh, to, um, to uh, unconditional convergence. 
So here is a specific rendition of the you know, traditional dual economy models, which is to say that what makes modern economies special is that in modern, in, the, in what makes modern sectors special is that in modern sectors, you actually do get unconditional convergence. These are your escalator industries. And unconditional convergence, by the way, means that regardless of whether your institutions are poor, your policies are screwed up, your geography is all bad, that once you get your labor and capital into these industries, they're going to be converging towards the labor productivity frontier. Now, this turns out to be quite a, uh, a general phenomenon. Uh, so it exists for um, all, uh, all um, uh, uh, manufacturing industries across the world. It exists at, at any level of aggregation you want to look at. So I've looked at this from four digit to all the way to aggregate manufacturing. Here, as you can see, just the two digit and the aggregate uh, manufacturing results. And the speed of convergence uh, is about the beta coefficient is about 2.9%, which is actually fairly high, so implying a, a half-life of full convergence of about 40 uh, to 50 years. Um, so it, it, for the whole economy, uh, you don't have uh, aggregate for, uh, unconditional convergence, but in the modern parts, in particular, modern organized manufacturing industries, you do have unconditional convergence. Now, how would you modify uh, your basic convergence equation, your basic growth equation, taking into account that part of the economy does exhibit uh, unconditional convergence? Well, um, uh, let me skip some of the other uh, evidence here. Well, you have a completely illegible uh, equation here, which um, uh, um, I guarantee you would have been very insightful if you could have seen it uh, in, 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 its, in its original form, okay? Uh, basically, well, this one really is screwed up. Um, <laughs> so as it says, you have the standard convergence <laughs> that is augmented by two additional terms. Uh, so you'll have to imagine what those two terms are. So the first term is really <laughs> fantastic. Uh, the, the first term is really the con conditional convergence part of the equation because you know the you know all the all, uh, you know the entire economy is subject to conditional convergence. Even these you know uh, modern manufacturing activities, if you have better policies, they'll grow more rapidly. So so there's that you know basically the the, the, the channel A. Uh, is um, the, the, the standard conditional convergence channel. Um, now, uh, the reason that, that, however, that in a lot of low to middle income countries we don't get much mileage out of this channel is that this is a slow accumulation process. That basically, if you think about the fundamentals being the level of human capital, um, the quality of your institutions, these are things that really do not change very rapidly. Um, and therefore, it's a so, slow process. Um, and also, you know, that, that we don't have really very good mechanisms of translating these fundamentals into a quick payoff policies. And that's another thing that we've learned. So the policy implications of these fundamentals channels aren't that, that clear cut. Um, so that's I think, has produced the result that, on the whole, uh, you don't get a whole lot of growth uh, out of the conditional ca convergence channel. And much of the growth uh, is going to come from somewhere else. Now, the second uh, channel, which is that in that sort of formal part of the economy, you have uh, the, the unconditional convergence. Now, as I've just shown you, that actually, that process is rapid. The problem, however, is that in the, the modern part of the economy is a very tiny share of the whole economy. So in the typical African economy, uh, formal manufacturing is going to employ something like 5% of the economy's entire workforce. So any convergence force you're getting out of the second channel is going to be multiplied by 5%, meaning that its aggregate growth rate isn't going to, its aggregate growth impact uh, isn't going to amount to a whole lot uh, um, uh, of its own. So this might actually seem that you don't get much growth out of the process of uh, rapid unconditional convergence in the modern parts of the economy. But of course, the central insight of the you know, tr dual economy tradition was that where you really get the growth is the structural transformation part, it's the structural change part. As long as your modern parts are on an escalator, right, that means that there's going to be a productivity differential between the modern and the traditional parts of the economy. 
um, and the structural change, namely moving labor from the traditional parts of the economy into the modern parts of the economy, is going to generate uh, rather large um, um, uh, productivity gains aggregate for the aggregate economy, and those are going to be the larger, the larger the resource movement from modern to from traditional to modern. And in fact, if you do sort of the decomposition, you know, a lot of countries relatively early in their development process, this is what really drives a lot of the growth, is really this process of moving labor from low productivity to high productivity activities. Now, um, so what does this say about the process of convergence, and in particular, why is it that uh, you know, we don't have more rapid convergence and why there are still poor countries in the world? Uh, as I said, uh, that basically um, the, the direct impact of uh, productivity convergence in the modern parts of the economy quantitatively tends to have a very small impact. And um, for the typical develop developing economy, in fact, the rate of structural change, the rate of growth of the modern parts of the economy is disappointingly slow. Not only that, increasingly, as I'll show you next, it goes in the wrong way. Okay? Five minutes? Okay. Ten? Okay. Um, I have, uh, yeah, 13. Okay. Now that's good. Um, um, mm -hmm. Um, so let me just show you some, uh, some figures which make this sort of um, alive. But let me also you know, put this point about uh, structural change being key on a somewhat broader cam canvas by talking about not just uh, broad intersectoral structural change, that this is really uh, is a kind of structural change uh, that often happens within industries and within sectors as well. So what we're happening is that it's, it's not, now what we're saying is, is um, uh, that a lot of sort of perverse structural change is, beco is, is becoming uh, a common feature of developing countries. So from manufacturing to services, so premature deindustrialization, from tradable to non-tradable, from organized sectors to informality, from modern to traditional, from medium to large to small firms. So we increasingly we're seeing this phenomenon which actually goes precisely against the logic of what would generate uh, sustained high growth. So I'm just going to show you um, a few charts that brings up the, quant the importance of that. One is if you just look in terms of broad growth patterns. Um, so if you look at um, Asian economies, for example, the quintessential high growth economies, uh, the, the yellow, the first one, is, is the component of growth that is due to structural change. Uh, so here it's positive. And look what's happening in regions like Latin America, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. That all the sort of the structural change components here are actually negative. So this is what this means that this is actually resources on average are moving from high to low productivity activities, and therefore they're reducing the overall growth rate. Um, and what um, is is you know it, it, it sort of you're putting that much more. Uh, um, uh, um, a burden on within mm -hmm. industries, within sector productivity growth uh, to sustain growth. And that's one reason, in fact, the, uh, those regions of the world aren't growing as rapidly as, as Asia. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of an example where structural change moves in exactly the right way, which is that you have, this is a Vietnam, a quintessential, quintessential recent Asian uh, success story. You have basically resources moving out of agriculture, reduction in the employment share of agriculture of about 20 percentage point, moving all to the urban areas, including uh, manufacturing. Um, what's on the vertical axis is the relative productivity of these different activities. So those are all the high productivity activities. This is the low productivity activity. So this kind of positive structural change in Vietnam in this period has accounted for roughly half of Vietnam's high growth, which has been uh, quite high. You compare that uh, with um, uh, the sort of um, pattern of structural change in Africa. Uh, look at sort of Kenya. Uh, this line is completely flat, which means that even though agriculture, a lot of people has come out of agriculture, where has it gone? Uh, it's gone to sort of informal services, wholesale retail trade services, where productivity hasn't been, is not actually very high. Um, Ethiopia is slightly better. 
but you know you haven't you haven't had nearly as much uh, 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 you know sort of uh, movement out of agriculture. And if you look at where manufacturing is, you see that it's actually not particularly um, not particularly uh, more productive. Uh, let me split that. Uh, the problem of informality um, is is particularly uh, uh, serious. Uh, this this shows sort of increasingly that countries are beginning to deindustrialize at earlier levels of income. Uh, so when you look at the first wave of industrializers, Germany, U.S., Sweden, and ask at what level of income did these countries actually begin to lose relative employment shares? Uh, that was sort of roughly at the level of income of about ten thousand uh, dollars and where in fact their employment share of manufacturing was something like 35%. Um, already sort of Mexico, which is a relatively industrialized country, begins to deindustrialize in 1990 at about 20% of its labor force where income is much lower. India has been deindustrializing effectively since 2002 at a much, much lower level of income. So premature deindustrialization. Uh, within sectors, remarkable, uh, look at uh, Mexico, uh, large firms are much more productive than small firms, um, and um, productivity in the small firms has declined by about 6.5%. In the large firms, it has increased by about 6%. Um, and what has happened to share of employment during this period? Actually, the small firms have increased uh, somewhat uh, their share of employment. Again, sort of adverse, perverse structural change happening in terms of the overall uh, size distribution of firms, okay? So uh, let me just recap with this and the next uh, slide and I'll stop. Um, um, I don't have time to go into the policy implications of this, but we could talk uh, maybe later in the panel. So I've basically said that there is, you need to keep, keep apart, if you will, the fundamentals and the structural transformation channels of growth. Um, and, uh, and if you start thinking about the policy implications of each one of these channels, there's a certain amount of overlap, but they're not one and the same. So I think that's why it's important. And, in and analytically, um, what that buys you is, is a kind of a, a, a taxonomy of growth processes or growth outcomes uh, that you can think in terms of this two by two box uh, that you know, if you want um, long-term uh, convergence, you know, you need to get both your fundamentals and rapid structural transformation. Um, uh, you know, uh, but if you only rely on investment in fundamentals, you're going to get relatively slow growth, which I interpret largely as the, pro as, as the outcome in Latin America in the last uh, decade and decade and a half, and largely, um, I think, sub-Saharan Africa's future. Um, uh, now, um, you can, of course, you know, rapid, Structural transformation can get you very rapid growth for reasons that I've, I've outlined. But if it's not going to be supported by investment in fundamentals, you basically run out of steam out of that process. But because once you sort of eliminate the large gains from these productivity differentials, you're not going to get much more gain out of productivity, out of structural transformation. So ultimately, you need to find a way of increasing productivity in your non-tradables, in your services, and that's going to be a much more of a process of investment in your fundamentals, human capital, institutional capability. So for long-term convergence, uh, this uh, is absolutely essential, although it doesn't necessarily get you um, rapid growth on the way there. So let me just uh, um, end here. <laughs>